The third resolution declares the necessity and propriety of a national bank. The first national bank was established chiefly by the same men who formed the constitution at a time when that instrument was but two years old, receiving the sanction of the immortal President Washington. The second national bank received the sanction of President Madison, holder of the proud title of father of the constitution. As subsequently, the sanctions of the Supreme Court, the most enlightened judicial tribunal in the world. Upon the question of the expediency, we only ask you to examine the history of the times during the existence of the two banks and compare those times with the miserable present. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the President's Day 2022 Washington, Lincoln and National Banking. My name is Bob Lynn. I'm a retired union organizer and political director of the United Association Plumbers and Pipefitters in Toledo, Ohio, Local 50. Today, we're going to talk about a few of the important things and, and what we can do. But I'd really like to focus on that last paragraph, if I might, uh, of what Lincoln said, because I think if you just substitute a couple other things, you can, you can actually get to where we are. Upon the question of expediency, the immediacy of what we're trying to do right now, if we examine the history of the times, the last four banks and compare those times and, and what we actually did and, and we compare to what we, where we are right now, I don't know if I'd say miserable present, but uh, we definitely have some challenges in front of us right now. And I think it's very important that we start to uh, continue to focus on why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, coming out of World War II, and the last iteration of the National Bank, uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the US was the powerhouse, the leader in manufacturing, industrial production and democracy. We were the envy of the world. Today, much of our manufacturing has been outsourced and the investment necessary to keep our infrastructure up to date has fallen by the wayside. Appropriations is the current method of financing and we have fallen further and further behind both internationally and domestically. We seem to have become politically paralyzed. What to do? What to do? Well, our fine panelists today will share the answer, which I think most of us on this phone call will agree is HR 3339, the National Infrastructure Bank. And so we're going to start right in right away, and we're going to start off with Alfeka Mutardi, who's uh, the professional macroeconomist and former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and is our go-to person on the National Infrastructure Bank. So Alfeka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and good evening. Uh, my name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist, um, and I worked with the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank, and we're in support of a bill in Congress, H.R. 3339, which would create a fifth uh, national infrastructure bank for the United States to finance our infrastructure. And we would need to look at the experience of our past presidents on this President's Day to see what they did with regard to the state of our country, improving the general welfare and getting our nation back on track economically and helping people uh, through four national banks that were supported by six great presidents, um, um, half of them from one side of the aisle, half from the other uh, at different times in our nation's past when we desperately needed a, an economic push forward and a means of developing our nation. A first bank of the United States under Hamilton and uh, George Washington. Uh, we're gonna have a, a presenter on, on, on that. And also um, uh, the second bank of the United States under Madison and John Quincy Adams, a third set of banks under Abraham Lincoln. We're going to have a presenter on that. And many times before we've talked on our Zoom calls about the reconstruction Finance Corporation uh, and how that helped us to get out of uh, the Great Depression and win World War II. So if I could go to the next slide and um, mention just something about 
where this impetus for having national infrastructure banks came from. Actually, it came right out of our constitution, which affirms the purpose of our government, which is to promote the general welfare. And it does this through something called a general welfare clause that is contained twice in our constitution, once in the preamble and a second time in a section that empowers our government to, uh, um, uh, to enact uh, laws that promote the general welfare, either through um, taxation or spending or by other means. Um, the Supreme Court has said that the binding uh, phrase, uh, general welfare, uh, that applies uh, legally in the Constitution is the one that's contained in the taxation and spending clause. And I'd like to read it to you. It says, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, but provided that these taxes should be uniform throughout the United States. So this is the means by which our constitution and our government allows us to lay taxes, pass laws, and even create a national infrastructure bank. And the Supreme Court has held that the power to tax and or create a national infrastructure bank uh, is an independent power uh, that is granted by this clause and uh, doesn't need to be derived from any other means. However, the court did limit that the power to spend for matters affecting should very much promote the general welfare. So if I could go to the next uh, slide. What do we want our national infrastructure bank to do to promote the general welfare? For, for one thing, we wanted to build public infrastructure. That is infrastructure that benefits everyone. We know what this is, but sometimes we take it for granted. Our fifth national infrastructure bank is empowered to uh, spend up to $5 trillion to finance projects that repair our transportation systems, that get us moving along our roads and our railroads and our high-speed transit, and can even build high-speed rail network nationwide. It'll repair our water systems. We take these for granted as well. When we turn on our pipe, on our faucets, we expect great clean water clean water to come out of the pipes, and that doesn't always happen. Many places uh, in the country have lead in the water or uh, other kinds of pollutants in the water. Some places in the United States shockingly have no water at all. So we want our uh, infrastructure bank to be able to repair and build out all these systems. Of course, we're reliant on our electric power grid. Uh, we, that delivers uh, electricity to us. And if that grid goes down, our whole county economy goes down and we want it to be ready uh, for uh, during storms. Uh, we want it to be cyber secure and we want it to be ready for bringing on electric vehicles. We must have a communication system. We've taken also for granted many places that have broadband uh, and easy access to broadband. We, again, we take it for granted, but many places in the country uh, don't have broadband. They have to drive miles out of their way even to get a cell phone connection. During COVID, um, uh, the whole country was reliant on homeschooling and telehealth, and uh, it didn't work in many parts of the country. This is an absolute must. Affordable housing. We must have places for people to live. Uh, they can't be living in tents uh, or outdoors. Uh, they, uh, one third of, uh, of our renters, one fourth of our renters are housing insecure. They're only a paycheck away from being um, evicted. Um, and if uh, they've lost their job because of COVID or uh, for any unforeseen circumstance, uh, they're very vulnerable. And we, we want large scale water projects to reduce drought in the Southwest where we grow 50% of our nation's food. If we don't take care of that, then certainly we're going to have higher food prices all across the country. So if I could go to the next slide. So what our national infrastructure bank will do will not be not to not only build all this infrastructure all across the country, but to create really revi uh, revitalize our American economy. Um, um, Bob has uh, interestingly uh, uh, quoted Abraham Lincoln to say that we are living in a miserable present. It might not be miserable in the United States right now for everybody, but it is for a large portion of the United States population. Uh, we want to create 25 million new great paying jobs. 
uh, by building all of this uh, new infrastructure. We want to buy America only for the construction inputs, which will promote our American manufacturing and lead to the creation of even more jobs. We want to get our growth rate up. We don't want to do all of this without making another call or burden on our federal budget, which can't afford to go any further into debt. So our National Infrastructure Bank is configured in such a way that it does not require new federal spending, no new taxes, no new deficit spending. Such a great idea, an idea really whose idea has come and will not stoke inflation either. This kind of investment really is productive for our American economy, gets trucks move, moving faster, increases uh, tr uh, communications, those kinds of things. And every single sector of the economy will benefit from the operations of the National Infrastructure Bank. Small and medium businesses will grow. There'll be spin-off business opportunities. Uh, along the high-speed rail network lines, we'll be promoting economic corridors. Workers will benefit. We'll lower income inequality, uh, urban and rural improvements. That this will be spending that will reach every single uh, corner of our American economy, and even federal, state, and local finances will improve. What's not to like from this? So if I can go to the next slide. And we want to make sure that our economic growth is equitable for everyone, that it reaches every single corner of America. We have 10 million working families in the United States that are not making enough money to cover their basic expenses. Uh, just look in uh, Joe Manchin's home state where you can go into any grocery store and ask the cashier and she'll tell you that half of the folks in that grocery store are buying their groceries with federal food stamps because they haven't got enough to make ends meet. Uh, I've, I've mentioned already about people who are housing insecure. Uh, disproportionate of all of these folks are people of color. We want to make sure our projects get into every single corner. So how is the National Infrastructure Bank going to deliver on that promise and that policy? First of all, the scale of the investment, $5 trillion in projects will create up to 25 million new great paying jobs. It'll benefit the most. 80% of these jobs will go to workers who uh, don't require any more than a two-year college education or even less, and will train them and get them certified in these great paying jobs. Their jobs must pay Davis-Bacon wages. That'll put more money into those workers' pockets in the middle, stimulate American manufacturing, provide fair access to the jobs for minorities and for women. Uh, and that provision of the, of the bill will be enforced targeted share of projects for disadvantaged business enterprises. They can sign up to uh, be, be certified as a DBE and make sure that they get a fair share of uh, the projects that come out of the spending. Also, we'll get into every single county using Jim Clyburn's 10-20-30 rule that ensures 10% of the projects get into areas where 20% of the population has been living below the poverty line for more than 30 years. And there's a trust fund in the, in the uh, uh, financing of the bank, in the bank's own internal operations, that as we fill it up slowly over time, we'll be able to find fund grants rather than loans to very low income areas that can't afford to take, to take a loan. And we'll build more affordable housing, 7 million affordable housing units. We'll build affordable broadband, get it into every single district, job training, earn while you learn. What's not to like about this? Let's get it done. Thanks. Thank you, Alfeca, for that. Um, <clears throat> next, I'm gonna ask Jack Hanna, uh, the former treasurer and interim chairman of the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. Uh, he's currently uh, the Oregon Democratic Party State Central Committee part of that. And uh, Jack is going to talk to us today about the first national bank and uh, Hamilton and Washington uh, and their brilliant idea. So, Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bob. Hello, everyone. I'm Jack Hanna, and I have the honor to describe to you tonight the ideas and efforts of George Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, who conceived of, promoted, and administered the United States' first national public bank. Let me set the stage of this story by first describing the crises that existed in the country from 1781 to 1793, immediately after the Revolutionary War. 
1781, the country was organized as a confederation of states, a loosely organized alliance that was functionally ineffective and economically failing. The states and national government had huge debts from the war that had never been repaid. In addition, there was runaway inflation and the states were bickering amongst themselves so much they refused to permit other states from transporting their goods and services across state lines because of rivalries and the lack of a federal system. By 1787, the forefathers wisely realized that a confederation just wasn't going to work and went to Philadelphia to negotiate, write, and approve the constitu Constitution in early 1789. George Washington was elected our first president and took office April 30th of 1879 and promptly appointed Hamilton as Treasury Secretary. Hamilton was originally from the West Indies and as a young man helped run his mother's business and then apprenticed with a large mercantile firm that traded with the colonies in England. This is where he acquired his unique financial skills by obtaining a practical knowledge of trade, finance, and the exchange of goods and services. Earlier in 1776, after his immigration to the colonies, Washington met and convinced Hamilton to become a vital clerk, his chief of staff, so to speak, throughout the war, and proved himself an exceptionally able administrator. Upon taking office as president, Washington promptly appointed Hamilton Secretary of the Treasury, and he immediately had to confront the crisis of trade, inflation, and public debt. All the states and local governments again had taken on debt during the war, but didn't bother to pay back practically one penny, and their credit was destroyed. Inflation was rampant, and economic depression existed all over the country. Sound familiar? Hamilton then conceived of a bold new idea to address the situation. He proposed the creation of a Bank of the United States, a central bank that would be capitalized by private investment to purchase bonds or securities in order to capitalize it. Within a week, of the bank's charter and creation, Hamilton raised more than enough money to pay off all the debts of the states and the federal government at full value and thereby stabilized the currency of the entire country by establishing public fiscal integrity and trust. Next, the most important, but most importantly for our discussion, he aimed to use the bank as an investment vehicle for creating an American economy, not solely based on agriculture, but to make the country self-sufficient in manufacturing. The goal was not to rely on England or Europe for manufactured goods, so we would be independent and self-sufficient. The bank was to promote the common economic good of the entire country. As a result, he provided investment and through the bank uh, uh, invested in manufacturing, uh, uh, imposed tariffs to create uh, 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 funds from the imports that occurred and used those funds to pay off the debt that the bank assumed. Most importantly, uh, the bank uh, successfully promoted industrial development and the general welfare of the entire country by financing the construction of roads, ports, uh, funding economic growth, and making money while doing so. History teaches us that lessons that we need to learn in order to be successful in our current and future endeavors. Hamilton and Washington's Bank of the United States has been employed four times in our country's history, 
each time successfully making money, but even more so promoting and prompting the development of our country's infrastructure and manufacturing capabilities. As we celebrate President's Day in 2022, let us not forget the brilliance and success of a national public bank, because today we need it more than ever as America confronts the challenges of international economic competition, global warming, and our antiquated public infrastructure. Thank you, and let us thank Alexander Hamilton and George Washington for all they did for our country and for creating and implementing an economic policies, a policy that's just as great today as it was over 200 years ago. Help us support and create, again, a national infrastructure bank. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, um, for that. Uh, since uh, we have just heard from Washington or about Washington, uh, it seems only apropos that we should go to the state of Washington now <laughs> and ask Linda if she would uh, kindly give us a, an update of some of the things that are going in, there in Washington state. So Linda, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm actually, uh, here in Washington and have been a resident here in Washington since the early 80s. Um, and I'm a retired state employee with the uh, Department of Children, Youth and Families. And I'm the former president and uh, of Washington State National Organization for Women and currently serve as the legislative co-coordinator for that organization. And I'd like to actually talk about today about what we've been doing here in Washington to see what we can do to support um, the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, back in December, Senator Hasegawa uh, dropped a bill into our state legislature called uh, Senate Joint Memorial 8006, which was a uh, resolution to Congress uh, from the legislature to uh, support uh, the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, and we've had a large number of endorsements across the state uh, from different or various organizations, from the 1st District Democrats, the 34th District Democrats, the King County Democrats, the Salish Sea Chapter of the Washington State Federation of Women, the Cascadia High Rails, High Speed Rail Association, Seattle Indivisible, and quite a number of other individuals uh, and organizations. They may, uh, for example, the Washington State National Organization of Women hasn't done a um, resolution, but they have been highlighting it in what, this, this particular bill in their weekly legislative alerts, ur urging our members to uh, lobby our legislators. And we have been lobbying our legislators. Um, we have uh, had a number of conversations within the Senate. And in fact, this past Tuesday, uh, this bill passed out of the Senate is now in our House of Representatives uh, for consideration. Uh, Washington State is a, has very short legislative sessions in the um, uh, even numbered years. It's only, it's only 60 days. So, uh, we have until the end of March to pass any bill out. So that bill that was passed by the Senate on Tuesday has to be out of its committee by two, Thursday of next week. That's one week from today. But we've been working hard with a number of representatives. We've, we've already spoken to about seven representatives about trying to them to to urge them to take the lead. And we've gotten some pretty positive support. And we actually have two more meetings tomorrow uh, with uh, representatives um, w dealing with the committee. So we're hoping that it will come out of the committee by next uh, Thursday, 5 p.m. If you're in Washington State, call your legislator. Uh, and then we have until Friday, March 4th, to actually pass this Senate Joint Memorial 8006 out of the legislature. Um, and I, I do want to talk a little bit of, 
more about why my organization actually is supporting uh, the National Infrastructure Bank. And that is because much of our country's and state's infrastructure has fallen into disrepair and many of our communities like housing, workable transportation networks, clean, safe, and sustainable water and food production ne networks. For example, in the area of transportation, many low-income women and their families struggle to find reliable transportation that can affect their health, resulting in missed appointments and poor illness management. Even if care is readily available, as well as access to healthy foods for themselves and their families. This new bank would create millions of tens of millions of high paying jobs, train our youth with skills that they could use for a lifetime and lift many of our disadvantaged persons out of poverty and despair. Additional jobs means more tax revenue for our cities, counties and state and improves the lives of those in our communities. And that National Infrastructure Bank is a win-win for our state and communities in that it provides reduced cost financial instruments for our local and state government infrastructure projects and a better quality of life for all of our state's residents, including women and children. So I want to thank you for your time and urge you to urge your legislators and urge your Congress people as we have been working here in Washington State with both our state legislators and congressional delegation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Linda. <clears throat> it's uh, very important what you what you say there, and and I believe most of the people on this uh, uh, presentation have uh, been working in that. But if you haven't, or if you're new to this, what what we need to do and continue to do is, as I always like to say, we need to build the parade so the politicians can run to the front and take credit for it at the end of the day, and we have to be able to uh, make that groundswell locally happen first. It appears right now from everything that we've seen that Washington, D.C. and the bubble that's there does not always seem to understand what's going on in the rest of the country. And I believe that what we have to really be able to do is get to people who are neighbors, our friends, the people we have direct influence on to be able to continue to talk to them and encourage them uh, to reach out and continue to talk to uh, those we elect and send to Washington in hopes of being able to get them uh, to understand what we're really going through in this country. So thank you very much again, Linda. Right now I'm gonna ask Ellen Brown, who's the founder and chairman of the Public Banking Institute uh, to please <clears throat> unmute. And she's going to give us a presentation on the other president that uh, we're focusing on today, Abraham Lincoln. So Ellen, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much. Um, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> do, you, do you have my slides? Maybe not. Okay, so Lincoln was a big advocate of the American system. Uh, the American system was basically national sovereignty uh, for public and uh, government, uh, government issued currency for for productive purposes. And so that was versus the British system, which was essentially colonization by debt. So Lincoln said in 1832, this is when he was 23, when he was first running for Illinois State Assembly, he said his political principles were a national bank, internal improvements, and a high protective tariff in order to nurture the, the um, businesses, small businesses for industrial development. So that was basically the American system. So already he was onto it at an early age. And when he was elected president, his economic advisor was Henry Carey, who uh, expanded on the American system uh, that was originally developed by Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay. Next. Um, when Lincoln came into office, he was immediately faced with a civil war and no way to fund it. If he borrowed from the banks, the Eastern bankers were going to uh, charged 20 to 25 percent interest, which would have left um, the government with a crippling debt. So instead, he did what the American colonists did, which was issue paper money backed by nothing but the full faith and credit of the United States. Um, so these were green U.S. notes or greenbacks. Originally, under the Legal Tender Act of 1862, $150 million was issued and spent. 
But uh, by the end of the war, that sum had increased to 432 million, uh, essentially doubling the money supply. If we did that today, it would mean adding some, if you count M2 as the money supply, it would mean adding $22 trillion to the money supply. And yet it wasn't inflationary as I'll show in a minute, <laughs> but anyway. Um, and he used that money to fund not only the war, but major infrastructure, including the land grant college system and the transcontinental railroad, next. So the same year, 1862, his Congress passed the Pacific Railroad Act, which uh, lent, lent $64 million uh, to build the transcontinental railroad. So it chartered two companies to lay the tracks from the Missouri River to Sacramento. So one started at one end and one started at the other end. And by 1869, they met nose to nose in Utah. So they were done. And at that point, they, those companies returned $103 million to the federal government. So not only did this money created out of nothing <laughs> create this amazing railroad system that connected the, the country from end to end, but it turned a significant profit for the federal government. And the money, of course, the, it's the nature of a loan that the money goes out and then it comes back. So it's not inflationary, particularly when it makes something productive like this. Next. Uh, you can see from this slide that it was not, in, that the greenbacks were not in, inflationary. This is the consumer uh, price index and it's shot up uh, in the last 30 years, but or no, more than that looks like the last uh, 60 years. But um, <clears throat> so anyway, so so during that period of this of the Civil War, it was not inflationary, a bit inflationary. Next, uh, Milton Friedman said, uh, in along with Anna Schwartz in their in their uh, big volume on monetary history of the United States, they said that uh, the greenbacks did not infl create inflation. They, they, did inf they did devalue relative to gold, but so did all the paper monies. And there were hundreds of paper monies then because the, this, the state chartered banks all issued their own bank notes. And um, Friedman and Schwartz said that the greenbacks were linked to a period of extraordinary rapid, extraordinarily rapid growth. Um, and then this other historian, J.G. Randall, also said in 1937, the threat of inflation was more effectively curbed during the Civil War than during the First World War. Indeed, as John Kenneth Galbraith has observed, it is remarkable that without rationing price controls or central banking, Treasury Secretary uh, Chase could have managed the federal economy so well during the Civil War. Next. Uh, so besides this greenback system where they issued their they issued money directly, uh, Lincoln was responsible for establishing which what is basically our banking system today uh, with the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864. This was under um, Treasury Secretary Salmon P. Chase, who was really responsible for these bills or, you know, so, so whatever's wrong with them, you can blame on him. But anyway, it was a Lincoln would have liked to have established a national bank, as you could tell from what he said when he was 23, but there was so much public sentiment against it after, um, after Andrew Jackson had jet shut down the second U.S. bank that uh, what they did instead was to create uh, what was called a distributed national banking system. So you had essentially national banks all over the country that were chartered by something new that was set up, the controller of the currency. So the controller of the currency issued U.S. banknotes uh, that were that all looked alike. Here's two two of the those two in that picture are from two different banks, and they have the name of the bank on them, but they they look just the same, and they say United States of America at the top. So it was a, a national currency issued through these many uh, national banks, and in order to get their national bank charter. Um, they had to, in order to get these bank notes, they had to um, secure them with U.S. bonds deposited in the treasury, equaling a third of their paid in capital. So this was another source of income for the government, and it also stabilized the, the banking system. In order to drive out the state bank notes, um, 
the the bills the the national banking acts impose 10 10% uh, tax on those bills so essentially what you had were a lot of national banks 584 national banks already by 1864 uh, and the currency was stabilized by the Office of the Controller of the Currency since um, the, the controller put a limit on the number of banks that could be issued and they were limited by, by this um, being secured by U.S. bonds. So after Lincoln was assassinated, of course, um, the greenbacks were recalled and silver was demonetized. So the money system radically shrank and drove us into a, a depression that was nearly as bad as the Great Depression of the 1930s. And so there was a strong populist movement in the 1890s to go back to Lincoln's system of government issued money funding um, national uh, infrastructure projects. But of course that failed and what we wound up with was the Federal Reserve and another an even worse depression in the 1930s. But, so that's the end of my Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln segment. Thank you very much for that, Ellen. Uh, I know that your uh, work with the Public Banking Institute that uh, you're a, a great resource when it comes to being able to understand this public banking. And, and I'm sure as we go along, as we get some questions on, on that, that uh, you'll be able to jump in and, and hopefully answer some of those. Um, next, I'm going to ask Representative Michael Pearson, who's uh, representative of the Missouri House of Representatives. Uh, Michael, if you could please unmute yourself and uh, the floor is yours. Well, well, thanks for, uh, for, for having me on. And uh, I can't wait until our uh, bill comes up again. Uh, I think it's up for a third reading, isn't it? Anybody know? I can't recall, but it, it would at least be a second reading there because uh, uh, you, you know I'm real adamant about getting this high-speed rail here in the state of Missouri. Uh, looks like it's going to be baby steps, but you know that's to be expected. Uh, right now, my focus is on the 10 to 15 mile uh, test track. Uh, more than likely, it's probably going to be, I would think, probably between Kingdom City and uh, and Columbia, considering the distance between the two is like 20 miles. So that 10, 15 miles fits uh, sweetly right in the middle there. So, but um, that's a that's pretty much the adjust of my uh, position. I am an advocate for uh, high speed rail, which uh, is inevitable. It's just a matter of when. And so uh, I, uh, I thank you for inviting me into your fold to help uh, affect that change. Well, thank you very much for that update, uh, Representative, and uh, good luck getting that uh, uh, through. And uh, definitely high-speed rail is a portion of, of what we're trying to focus on. It, it's uh, all the infrastructure needs that we have in this country. Uh, especially the one uh, that uh, our next speaker is going to talk about uh, uh, is Erica Straussberger, who's from Pittsburgh City Council. And uh -huh. uh, everyone kind of had been in the news. Uh, we saw that uh, they had a bridge collapse there in Pittsburgh. It's not the only one, but uh, it's the latest one. Uh -huh. and so, Councilwoman, if you wouldn't mind, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here and great to be here with everyone. I appreciate you inviting me this evening. Yeah, so I happen to live a mile and a half from the Fern Hollow Bridge, which is one of um, one of our many bridges. We have more bridges in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh than any city in the world, believe it or not. And uh, we have one fewer today because of the collapse of this bridge, which was rated in poor condition along with uh, dozens of others throughout our region. And the reason being that um, cities like Pittsburgh simply don't have the funding to be able to address our infrastructure at this, the speed at which it is required, especially a city like Pittsburgh, which lost um, a quarter of its population after 1979 and our major steel industries, uh, our major industry, which was steel manufacturing collapsed. Um, and we lost, um, I said a quarter of our population, but since the 1950s, the city's actually lost half of its population. Um, we simply don't have the, the tax base ourselves to be able to repair our infrastructure using our own tax base. 
Um, we have to rely on state funds. We have to rely on federal funds. And, you know, given that um, Pits cities like Pittsburgh have seen a rebirth many different times over the last um, hundred years, I think our, our next rebirth could be um, becoming a healthy city for everybody. That means strong, hard infrastructure. That means social infrastructure. That means people are able to get to work that are, uh, work means good paying jobs. Everyone has broadband. There's strong public transportation and you don't have to worry about risking your life when you're crossing a bridge. Uh, it also means that we have strong um, water systems that provide clean water for everyone and clean air for everybody. We really could be, I think that we could be a region in a city that um, you know, is, the van is on the vanguard of that across the country. But we need funding to be able to do so. Right now, um, with all eyes on, on this bridge, all eyes are on every other bridge, including another that happens to be in my district that I represent in city council and uh, uh, that people are worried about it might be held up by um, wooden planks. It's not actually the case, but that's what the news media is reporting on. So um, all eyes are on, um, on our bridges, but certainly infrastructure more generally. Uh, it's forcing us as a city council to come up with creative solutions to uh, determine what our major asks will be how we will apply for competitive grants through the infrastructure act that just passed. And even that is just not going to be enough to address all of our needs in a city like ours. Um, we need, given that the infrastructure act that has passed federally will take care of about 10% of the city of the country's needs. Um, we, we need an ongoing source of support. And that's why I was proud to um, pass a resolution along with my colleagues 18 months ago um, in favor of the National Infrastructure Bank. And um, I continue to advocate for it with my colleagues, um, talking about that the other day, um, trying to educate them, um, get a briefing together, our mayor, and ultimately get as many of our, our leaders in Congress um, supporting this in our region, um, because I think the photo that you saw is illustrative of, of the reasons why we need it in our region. And what the future could look like if we truly had ongoing investment um, that could take care of, allow us to take care of our residents in the way that they deserve. So appreciate you being here tonight and um, all the advocacy work you all have done and I'm standing with you. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. Uh, that was fantastic. The, the thing that uh, I definitely hear that you're saying and, and that all of us should understand is that what the National Infrastructure Bank is at the end of the day is it's an investment in ourselves. It's an investment in every city, every state, every citizen of the United States to be able to try to get the infrastructure needs that are out there, get them met in a form or fashion where it doesn't matter who or what the, uh, the government currently is made up with, whether it's Republicans are in control or Democrats are in control, we start to have a, a national infrastructure bank that has that long-term investment that goes across the board to be able to serve all of us. And that's the thing that we have to be able to focus on and be able to do it. Basically what we're asking for this and what this bank does, it's, it's like a mortgage. It's, we're, we're, we're taking a mortgage out for all the investment that we need to do in the infrastructure in this country to be able to do that so that we can take it and be able to actually monetize the debt that's currently out there and be able to take that and invest in ourselves. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to now ask uh, Representative Emily Kincaid uh, if she wouldn't mind uh, giving us a little bit more of an update more broadly on uh, what's going on in Pennsylvania. So uh, Representative Emily Kincaid. Hi, thank you guys for having me and, and thank you for the work that you are doing on this. Um, right now in Pennsylvania, we have, uh, as you can see on your screen, House Resolution 113, which is uh, sponsored, primarily sponsored by uh, Representative Ed Nielsen out of Philadelphia. Um, and it basically would, uh, it, it's uh, a request for the National Infrastructure Bank um, and Unfortunately, uh, in Pennsylvania, we have such a partisan gridlock, uh, and the way that our legislature works is that the majority decides entirely the agenda. And so when we have democratic legislation, democratic bills, even common sense ones like this, uh, 
you know, it, it, they really get bogged down. What I find interesting is that in Pennsylvania, we have, um, we had nine bridges that we needed to get repaired across the Commonwealth. And we entered into a public private partnership that was really driven by Republicans in the state legislature because they were championing, you know, public private partnerships are the way to go. This is how we get these bridges rebuilt. So now these bridges have been rebuilt and, and what they agreed to was that there would be tolling on the bridges in order to pay off the cost of these nine bridges. Well, now that the chickens have come home to roost and it, they actually have to start tolling these bridges to pay them off, now all of a sudden they don't want to do that because a lot of these bridges serve their constituents. They're going to, they're, they're talking about, they're going to be a bottleneck, which is a lot of what, uh, you know, we were raising at the time that, that this, you know, whole partnership passed is that like, you know, when you toll it, like, it's not going to go well. Um, so now we are dealing with the ramifications because public private partnerships are really not the way to go to really, and, and I'll, I'm preaching to the choir here right now, uh, to, to be able to fund our infrastructure because it's not enough money. There's not enough, you know, investment there. And it really is like putting a bandaid on a bullet hole. Uh, it just, it's, it's, it's not working. So, um, I signed on today to a letter that's probably going to go out on Tuesday, um, with, uh, representative Nielsen, representative Eddie day Pashinsky, and a number of my other colleagues asking speaker Brian Cutler and leader Carrie Benninghoff to move this resolution forward, especially now, because we are literally seeing our infrastructure crumbling down around us. Um, and, and, and even beyond the Fern Hollow Bridge, I live on the north side of Pittsburgh. And one of the biggest infrastructure issues that we have are massive landslides. And they are incredibly expensive to fix. Um, and we have numerous uh, active landslides that we're really trying to mitigate at this point. And the National Infrastructure Bank would also help to fix that because we're, and we're seeing a lot of people whose homes, properties, businesses are impacted by landslides as climate change is getting worse, as we are developing in sort of irresponsible ways. Uh, and we're really seeing the impact of that uh, and National Infrastructure Bank would help. And so these are common sense solutions and we're trying to push uh, Republican leadership to actually move common sense solutions forward and call on Congress to pass a National Infrastructure Bank. Thank you very much for that representative. Uh, keep up the good work and good luck with that as you're going forward. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, <clears throat> Dennis Montoya, who is the immediate past state director of New Mexico LULAC uh, to uh, share with us what's going on in New Mexico. Well, Dennis? thank you and good evening. Um, thanks to everyone who is presenting. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge your birthday. I am the immediate past state director of LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. You can see our logo on the screen in front of you, and you will notice a year at the bottom, 1929. Well, it happened to be this day, the 17th of February, 1929, that LULAC came into existence. So we celebrate our 93rd birthday today. And uh, we kind of have our work cut out for us. We um, aspire to represent all of the Latinos in the United States. We are a very diverse community. We range from native Indo-Hispanos in the Southwestern United States to Puerto Ricanos, uh, on the Eastern Seaboard, Dominicanos, uh, Cubanos, people from Central and Latin America, all are members of LULAC. But I would like to focus on some of the progress that we're making in the state of New Mexico, which is my home state. As was mentioned earlier in this meeting, uh, yesterday there was a very productive meeting with the veterans caucus of the state Democratic Party in New Mexico, 
And I know that Rudy Martinez, I believe, is on this call, and he's a member of that caucus, a former um, member of the House of Representatives, I should say former and probably future member of the State House of Representatives. A moment ago, you saw on your, on your screen our resolution for New Mexico LULAC, which has passed in support of H.R. 3339, which is uh, encouraging the creation of a national infrastructure bank. Um, we had recently uh, a resolution before the New Mexico House of Representatives, H.R. 47, and I know that Mark Strand was in attendance, as was I, when that was debated. Unfortunately, it was narrowly tabled by one vote. Uh, I share in, in Mark's uh, disappointment that that one vote probably came from a member of our own party, but uh, these are, are not defeats, they are temporary setbacks because as we continue uh, to have meetings like this one, uh, to educate the public on the benefits of a national infrastructure bank, uh, we continue to gain support. The chair, uh, of the House Transportation and Public Works Committee uh, that hosted a, or actually entertained HR 47 was very much a supporter, um, as were three other members. It was tabled by a vote of four to five, the narrowest. So uh, it just means we'll be back again. Uh, we have short legislative sessions as well. This year it's a 30 day legislative session. As Alfeca points out, what is not to like? 25 million new jobs, um, equity, affordable housing, available broadband, addressing some of the issues that are tearing our country apart. A lot of people would, would have us believe that there are fundamental differences in our population that somehow separate us into warring camps, but really the difference is in the distribution of resources. And LULAC's focus absolutely in supporting the creation of a national infrastructure bank is access to equity and the creation of jobs. While I have heard quite a bit this evening about the rehabilitation of aging infrastructure, I would remind you on this call that there are parts of the country, including my own, where we are waiting uh, for the building of our first infrastructure. We um, in New Mexico live in a state where there are still many, many dirt roads. We live in a state where um, large segments of the population are without access to clean and available drinking water, water for sanitary needs. Um, yes, we do have deteriorating infrastructure here as well, but the opportunity to bring this country together uh, to provide equal access to basic human needs is something that is offered by the National Infrastructure Bank proposal and something that we very much support. As um, Ms. Uh, Toasty Lane from Washington State pointed out, tens of millions of high paying jobs and training can bring parts of our country that have long lagged behind, including the part of the country from which I speak to you, um, on a par with the rest of the United States. So in New Mexico, we have been working in very dedicated fashion uh, to make this happen. There is a very strong coalition for a state public bank in New Mexico. Um, that coalition has the ear of our governor and uh, they are very much in support of the National Infrastructure Bank as complimentary. So we've got some support from there. We're looking forward to some support from the Veterans Caucus of the State Democratic uh, Party. We already have the wholehearted support of New Mexico LULAC. And there was a very recent development that I've spoken to Stuart about. We are invited to participate 
in a podcast slash radio broadcast sponsored by the tribes. I don't know if there are any tribal representatives on the call tonight, but I can tell you that the tribes are kind of the new movers and shakers economically in our country. And they are taking a great interest in uh, many of our national affairs, including the proposal uh, to create a national infrastructure bank. So we will be invited. I would uh, like to have, we are invited. Uh, I will be hosting and interviewing someone. I'm hoping we can get Alfeca. It's gonna be on a Saturday. And we will continue to promote this idea uh, so that the next time we appear in front of the House Transportation and Public Works Committee in New Mexico, we'll get that one additional vote and maybe a few more. Contrary to our perception at times, politicians do respond to uh, public sentiment and public pressure, and we just need to keep it up. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, uh, and I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you very much for that, Dennis. I did see that in the chat. You did say that one of the obstacles that we face is that politicians fear that they're losing uh, control or losing power. When well, I think, I think it panics them. <laughs> I, I, I believe it does too. And, 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 and that is definitely one of the challenges that we face. What do you see, you know, uh, what do you see as a way that we can talk to them to be able to say that this can be beneficial, not just for them to take up as a political win in order to do it, not just for them, but for us, but how, how do we get them to, to understand that the appropriations process isn't going away anytime soon, uh, that this here will do what they have failed to do and what we, as a country, we really need to do? What do you see as what we could do? I don't think we present it to them that way. We're not going to tell them that they have failed. We're going to tell them this is an opportunity for them to shine. Uh, and we're going to let their constituents repeat that refrain over and over again until it's unmistakable. Uh, politicians do respond uh, to hearing from their constituents, and that's why it's so important that we continue to educate the public because not enough of the constituents understand what this proposal is and what it's all about. So um, I think uh, we make them think that they thought of it and we give them the opportunity of presenting it as their original idea. Absolutely. That, that's exactly, that's always the way you have to do it. Uh, you know, uh, we have to figure out how to be able to get them and spoon feed it to them. And so all of a sudden it's like, hey, this is a brilliant idea. My wife yep. does it all the time. So you, you I mean, took I gotta... words right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> this is I was thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, thanks for that, Dennis, to be able to do that. And our last presenter, before we start uh, calling on other people to, to talk about, is Representative Alan Green. He's also uh, a former representative uh, from the state of Missouri. So uh, Representative Alan Green, if you could uh, share with us what uh, has been happening in Missouri from your point of view. First of all, good evening. And it's a privilege, always a privilege to talk about uh, this particular uh, interest in the country, which is infrastructure. Uh, I've had a chance now to do some, uh, as we call lunch and learns with uh, Illinois Department of Transportation, Missouri Department of Transportation and, and get a hold of uh, what were some of the needs and what's going on. But in the last 10 years in my journey of working in government, had the opportunity to also look at tow roads and a private public partnership the young lady had mentioned earlier. And I, it put a smile on my face because she just regurgitated the research years ago that I had to uh, do and, and look at. And she put it and hit it right on the head. It's the conflict of interest, what's going to happen, the sharing of the funds when you're talking about what happens with tow roads. And that was the research that I had found. One of the things we looked at too was gas tax. In the state of Missouri, within the last couple of years, we passed the gas tax. And now the house is looking at repealing the gas tax. Well, the state of Missouri was running anywhere from about 25 years behind on projects here in the state. And so we needed something. 
when we're talking about looking at tow roads, looking at gas tax, looking at how we're going to fund the infrastructure. The state of Missouri has one of the largest uh, roadways in the country here. And so we needed to find some way we we're going to fund this and move forward for the future. What a gas tax got passed, and like I just stated, now it is looked at to be repealed because as we all know, the gas tax has gone up. But in St. Louis County, I want to talk about this resolution. St. Louis County two weeks ago passed the resolution for the infrastructure bill. Very proud of that, very proud that they did that. The House in the state of Missouri uh, has presented the resolution before the House. And as uh, Representative Pearson had mentioned, it's on its second uh, read right now. And so that bill is being reviewed and looked at. That resolution actually is being reviewed. And so one of the things I want to talk about tonight too is the National Infrastructure Bank helps disadvantaged neighborhoods and businesses. Uh, Becca already mentioned some of this, so I'm just gonna be regurgitating some of the things that she already said too. Uh, again, there are provisions on the National Infrastructure Bill uh, on House, House Bill 339 to support you know, underserved and minority communities, workers and businesses. Uh, Rebecca mentioned some of that, so I won't go through all of that. But one of the key incidents that I wanted to talk about too is that it is expected to be $5 trillion in infrastructure by the, by the bank and will create 25 new, new jobs, great paying jobs, address current unemployment, provide on the tr job training and lift people out of poverty. I'll say that again, lift people out of poverty. Five things to consider to do when we talk about preparing for these opportunities if we get this passed. Read the bill. House, you know, when we talk about the, the bill, uh, the con Congressional Bill 339, look and do your research. The, uh, the, the information also was shared with the councilman in Kansas City. And one of the things that he shared with the group was that he was going to read this bill. I'm asking everyone and anyone that's listening to read the bill, get used to the language, understand the language. It is a great investment and in what we're attempting to do and get prepared by making sure that and expect the significant portions of infrastructure flows. If we understand what's gonna happen with the bill, you will understand how the money is going to flow. So think city, state, county, ports, schools, water, utilities, Think about those things. Be proactive. Be proactive. And that, again, I said, reaching out to our congressional delegation, letting individuals know that this is very, very important. But if you are a general contractor or subcontractor that's also out there, this is going to be a great aid to continue to put people back to work. I'll mention that again. This is going to be a great aid. One of the things that we like of course, in this country is manufacturing again. This is going to help bring some of the manufacturers back to the United States. We need that. So I just wanted to say again, in uh, looking at how we need to do to support this bill, be prepared and get educated. And I thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, <clears throat> we appreciate uh, your sharing that. And, and you actually have the, the most important message that we have to get out here today. And that's what we need to reach out to our uh, state delegations, our local delegations, and our especially our uh, Washington delegations to be able to, to communicate what's going on. Uh, as Dennis was saying, uh, they are responsive when they hear from people. They don't get that many letters. They don't get that many. They get complaints, but they don't get a whole lot of uh, letters uh, of support about ideas that are uh, important to, to citizens out here. And I think what by us being able to talk to our neighbors and being able to talk to our friends and encouraging them to do it, hopefully we can start to generate the kind of uh, groundswell that it's gonna take for this to happen. At the end of the day, uh, it's been said that nothing gets done except by a small group of people who are highly motivated to do it. And that's what we are and that's what we need to do. Uh, in order to change the world, what we have to do is be able to go out there and get uh, people to understand uh, what's so important about this infrastructure bill, how it's an investment in ourselves. Appropriations and, and, and the way we've been doing things, that's taking money and, and, and putting spending. This here is a lending program to get it out into all the communities so that they can be able to 
take the money that's there and be able to, over time, be able to have that investment so that they can get that payback at the end of the day for all of us. Yes, excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to use the uh, the chair here and ask for Lou Spencer, who uh, doesn't have a slide here to tell us what's going on. But everybody, if if you've been on the call before, you've seen Lou Spencer, and if not, you're in for a treat. Lou, if you don't uh, if don't mind, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing with what's going on in Virginia, I'd appreciate that. Sure. We uh, we were on a call with uh, we were on a call the other day with uh, Abigail Spanberger. Um, her congressional district has been uh, changed quite a bit, and um, we invited her to take another look at HR three 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 nine, the National Infrastructure Bank, and that generated uh, some enthusiasm with her and her staff. And we've reached out. We're going to try to set up a meeting with her. Um, I explained to her that I was one of the people who sat in traffic on Interstate ninety five a few weeks ago. Um, for 17 hours, we had a snowstorm come in. My daughter's house was without power. She had no heat. I was actually on my way home and got detoured going to her place. And the worst part about it was where I was stuck. There was no cell phone service. So I couldn't call out and my family couldn't reach me. I think this uh, may have struck a nerve with Abigail Spanberger's, uh, group, her staff and, um, uh, so we're going to use that as an opportunity to try to see if we can uh, get a meeting and get her on board with the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, I explained to her, I said, you know, people talk about us becoming a third world country. We're a third world country now. And if we don't get something together soon on real infrastructure, roads, bridges, waterways, railways, uh, water treatment plants, uh, you name it, broadband. Where I'm at in Essex County, Virginia, the Essex County Board of Supervisors passed a resolution in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. And uh, they did it on the same evening where they learned that they had been denied a grant that would have completed the last little bit of broadband in the county. Well, that's the part I live in. So uh, a lot of things happening. We're trying, but we can't seem to do it fast enough. We need everybody's help and everybody's support. And I want to thank everybody on the call tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, not everyone knows who, who you are, et cetera. So if you wouldn't mind, just, just tell us uh, your titles. There's people so. on this call that don't know who I am. That's amazing. Uh, my name is Lou Spencer. I'm the assistant business manager with Plumbers and Gas Fitters Local 5. We're in Washington, D.C. We operate in Washington, D.C., all of Southern Maryland and all of Northern Virginia. So thank you. Perfect. Thanks for that, Lou. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I talked to a, a fellow brother, a brother, uh, fellow UA brother, uh, John Zane, who's uh, John Kane, Pennsylvania. And John Kane. Yep. Or John Kane. I'm sorry, right. Kane. I did talk to him uh, uh, here a little while ago about it, and and he has uh, uh, promised to try and move things uh, forward there in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's a business manager up there from the plumbers in Philadelphia and was there. And uh, we actually got to share thing as a, uh, we were both uh, union organizers at the same time. And we're at a couple of conferences together. So uh, yeah, we're we actually close. Local five is close friend with John's local. And uh, we supported him in his campaign. And I've reached out to his staff as well. And I've tried trying to get them enthused about the National Infrastructure Bank as well. Yes. And, and I will tell you that, that, that things are moving in, in a lot of areas. I mean, uh, we haven't had representatives of everybody that uh, on here that has uh, uh, made some things move, but in Maine, they've passed things. New Mexico has. Delaware, they, they actually passed it and have moved up uh, to be able to try and influence their, uh, their brother, uh, who happens to be uh, president of the United States, who comes from the state of Delaware, to be able to take this thing up. We really feel that this is an opportunity to be able to make uh, some fantastic inroads in, at the end of the day, because the infrastructure bill that we put out there is only a small pittance of what we really need in this country. 10% at most is what the appropriations is for the investment that needs to be done in this country. That other 90% is unfunded, unrealized, and we 
Uh, the only way we can make that happen is by utilizing the National Infrastructure Bank. So thanks again, Lou, for all your work and, and uh, everybody else. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to throw the floor open a little bit here. Uh, if you would like to uh, speak to this, what I'd ask is that you raise your hand uh, and uh, we'll call on you and uh, see if we can, if you have any questions, comments, or if you want to give us an update, I greatly appreciate that. So, Dennis, it looks like you want to say something else. Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you. I want to just comment very briefly on what Representative Green said and Mr. Spencer and a couple of others. Um, we all need to read that bill and become uh, very adept at explaining our position, both because there's a lot of lack of knowledge out there, but there are some deliberate attempts at spreading misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and that was very apparent in the committee hearing that uh, I attended at the New Mexico State Legislature because uh, and you're not going to stop certain politicians from taking off on a tangent and, and saying some really ridiculous things. Uh, but I think we need to get very good at explaining that when we say China is outdistancing us uh, in infrastructure, we're not saying that we want to adopt a Chinese communist form of government. And of course, there are those who jump right in and say, well, that's what you're doing. Uh, quite the opposite. If we are going to compete uh, with totalitarian centralized dictatorships, we better be better than they are at playing that game. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dennis. The one thing I will say is that quite interesting that you bring up China, who spends about 8% of their GDP on infrastructure, and they actually have two infrastructure banks within the country. And at that time, uh, they actually said they did a study <coughs> or a study, a report, and they said that China is using an Alexander Hamilton style bank. So that's the thing you have to tell them is. That China's stealing from us again. They're stealing <laughs> our idea. That's and it. And we're too, you know, we're too, uh, I don't know, too stubborn to utilize our own idea in order to win this game. And so I would encourage everybody to, to remember that China is using the Alexander Hamilton style National Infrastructure Bank. They're using two of them to beat us at our own game. And that's why we have to get back in the game and our own to be able to make this different. Teresa Allen, I see you have your hand up, so the floor is yours. Well, you created uh, a great segue because I was just going to say, we need to look at what China and these uh, Asian and European countries are spending on the dollar for infrastructure, number one. And so that's essential, just as we see in this country, some states outspend others on their infrastructure. Uh, Ohio ranks near the bottom in comparison to many of our neighboring states, including Kentucky, spends more, on the, and West Virginia spends more on the dollar on infrastructure than Ohio. So that was one point. And then uh, I was going to say a big part of this infrastructure bill addresses a lot of needs. And I learned this, I can't think of Dr. Uh, who's on this, uh, who's done trainings on this calls, doctor from out in California. He, uh, Stephen um, Hubbard. Um, yes, Dr. Hubbard. And you. I learned from him several months back that as we address the infrastructure, and I see, again, we have a lot of people concerned about going green, as m many of us are. The fact of the matter is to go green we need to address upgrading and improving the ability and service of our energy grids. And we can't have all electric commercial and uh, personal vehicles or electric homes, or I should say solar powered homes and uh, solar powered commercial buildings till the energy grid can support the charging of those uh, uh, type of things. Just like take the city of Chicago or New York, a bus fleet, if they want to make them go all electric, they have to be able to be charged. Would their energy grid support that? 
And that's just one small sampling. So some of this stuff we do have to do in stages to accomplish the smaller things to be ready to be all green or to have electric vehicles, both commercial and personal. It just can't, boom, we're gonna do this. There has to be some phases to prepare the energy grid, to prepare the charging stations. I live in rural Ohio. I bet I wouldn't see a charging station for years or maybe even decades because we pay for 4G on our phone service right now. And most of the time, the bars on our phone, phone never indicate 4G. And now they wanna to move to 5G and we're still trying to get the full 4G access. So I know in, in bigger cities, you may not realize that, but you know the broadband and a lot of those things, again, don't hit a lot of rural people. So I'm just saying everything has to go in stages and this bill will help us do that besides cleaning up water and water and sewer and, and the lead and the pipes and so many things that uh, Americans across the board have to deal with. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Teresa. And Teresa, if you wouldn't mind, could you share uh, some of the work as far as your titles and that kind of stuff so people know who you are a little bit? I am Teresa Allen, and I'm the chairperson of All Aboard Ohio, uh, the statewide uh, recognized nonprofit advocacy group for passenger rail and mass transit here in Ohio. And I've been a two-term township trustee a county commissioner candidate. And so I have a, a bit of a background in economic development uh, far beyond some of my uh, comrades because I made sure I was smarter than everybody else because uh, I had to be to get elected in this rural area uh, as a woman. So um, anyway, that's my background. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Teresa. Uh, one thing that uh, I kind of want to make uh, a note of here is that in Ohio, we have been doing a couple of things. One of the, one is we actually have gotten a, a resolution, a bipartisan resolution introduced in the uh, state house. Uh, so far, it hasn't gone as far as we'd like, but uh, we continue to to push that forward and 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 make some uh, advances on it. Additionally, uh, the National uh, Black Legislator Conference actually has endorsed the National uh, Infrastructure Bank, HR 3339. And <clears throat> what I would say is that we have also talked to the Ohio Black uh, legislative leadership, uh, and they are in the process of hopefully adopting that and passing it forward. So again, there are so many groups that have a real vested interest in trying to make infrastructure successful in this country. And we are all part of them some way, some form, some fashion. And if we can all do that little bit, it's like the ant and the rubber tree that we always heard about. It's, a, it's about you doing your small part. We all have that small part. If every one of us does our small part to be able to do it before we know it, this can be a successful thing. So thank you again for that, Teresa. I see Michael Pearson has his hand up. Michael, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead. It's, you know, it's just the idea that if there wasn't a need for what we are doing here, uh, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. I mean, w I don't know when it started with the banks, when they became almost completely self-servant uh, because banks used to be farms. Now they're warehouses. You could take your money and you can grow your money, but it's like you take it there and it's just simply in a, in a holding position. You know, where it can't do it anymore. So had the banks not become so self-serving, then there would not be no use for, for the in in IB. So they uh, the, uh, the the one percentage used to play is uh if it wasn't if if banks were serving and not self-serving, then there wouldn't be any need for uh this this initiative that we got started here. So so I'm just well, glad that that uh, this group does exist because uh, I don't know how much longer it was gonna last until the wheels fell off, I, I presume, but why should we wait until the wheels fall off before we have something that can effectively help the growth, particularly of our communities and, and the infrastructures therein? Yeah, 
it, it, if you wouldn't mind, one of the things that I'm going to ask is I'm going to ask Ellen Brown, who's with the Public Banking Institute. Ellen, you know, there's a difference between the commercial banks out there and, and how they're driven and what a public bank is. And North Dakota, I know, has a public bank. What are the advantages and why is this so important to be able to do it, if you wouldn't mind sharing that? Okay, so a public bank is a bank owned by the lo uh, local government. So it could be a city, a state, a tribe, a county, but local anyway, uh, owned by the people of the locality. And its mandate is to serve the public. So that's the difference. And a commercial, but private commercial bank, its mandate is to make as much money as it can for its shareholders. A public bank's shareholders, well, the national, the North Dakota model is that the shareholders are the state itself. The state is virtually the only shareholder. They, I think they have two or 3% individual um, shareholders, but you know, they do, it's very minor. So it's mostly the state and the state's revenues are deposited in the bank. By law, all of the state's revenues are deposited in the Bank of North Dakota. It's very successful and very profitable because they've cut, largely because they've cut out the middlemen. So they don't have shareholders uh, pushing for short term profits or, you know, and taking the profits off the top. They don't have high paid CEOs. They don't have high paid executives. They partner, not compete with the local banks. So they help the local banks with liquidity and capitalization and um, some with re regulation. So it's a, it's a very effective model and, and we have public banks all over the world. I mean, the US is behind the rest of the world in public banks. So China, for, China is obviously the leader, but they seem to have gotten a lot of their ideas from our original models of um, going back to Alexander Hamilton and Lincoln. And uh, we did have a question on here, and Alfeca, I'm going to ask you to kind of do it. It says, if the NIB is created, what are some of the ways states and other borrowers secure the funds to pay the loans back? I would think part of it would be upgrades, paying for themselves when costly maintenance and fixes are no longer needed. Uh, can you just kind of expound on that just a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, Alfeca? It's a great question. The, the primary objective here is to keep our public infrastructure public. So what, why we wanna have public roads, why we wanna have uh, low cost um, um, broadband where private companies have not put it in, uh, why we wanna have all you know clean water, uh, local transit, even if we have to subsidize it a little bit, is because again, this is all for the general welfare. Now, when anybody would come into the National Infrastructure Bank, to borrow to improve their uh, local projects. For example, a city or a county that wants to do some development, it can either bundle the projects, it could do one off project, like improve a, a water sanitation plant, um, whatever it needs, whatever the local area needs are, are what could form the project. So there's a direct link between the local need and getting a loan. Now, how would it repay back the loan? One aspect of the National Infrastructure Bank is its scale. It's going to be doing $500 billion per year in projects, which will really grow the American economy. And so while everybody is out doing all of their infrastructure projects year after year, employing more people, uh, those people are getting paid better, uh, that's promoting more businesses in the locality, all of this will grow the economy and that will grow revenues for local governments and, and to enable them to repay back the loan. The proof of the pudding is how local finances have improved coming out of COVID. Uh, the, the, the government paid a whole bunch of stimulus checks. True, that was mostly for consumption spending, but it did improve. It did put money into people's pockets and they spent it. And that raised people's uh, revenues all across the country and uh, local finances improved. So you could just see how quickly and how responsive uh, local finances are to an improvement in growth. And by the way, growth last year was 5.7%. That was really an astounding growth level. I don't know if we'll be able to sustain it, but you can see how growth 
is related to local finances that improves revenues to allow uh, local governments to pay, rate, pay back these loans. Some of them will have user fees associated, like if a, uh, a water company borrows the money, then it'll repay back out of its uh, water uh, usage fees. Um, some, some things will have user fees coming in, but, but for the most part, it'll be the improvement in growth and local revenues that'll allow these uh, local authorities to repay back loans. Thank you very much. And, and the key here is that the national debt that we have and everything else, the only way we're ever going to pay it off, we can never cut enough in our budgets to be ever able to pay off the, the debt that we've currently accumulated. The only way it'll ever happen is we have to grow out of it. And the only way we can grow out of it is to invest in ourselves and have this kind of investment so that we can actually put ourselves to work, pay ourselves better, pay for that, and then magically that uh, debt will start to disappear to be able to make it happen. But those are all the things that have to happen eventually. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor one last time. If we have any other questions, uh, raise your hand. Otherwise, we're getting close to about the end of the meeting here. I don't see anybody else. Last call. I appreciate everybody who's taken the time to get on here. If this is one of your first times, Welcome, and I hope you learned something. If you need to know uh, the information, like Dennis was saying, to be able to talk intelligently about this, please visit the, our Facebook page or our website to be able to do that uh, so that you can get the quick summary to be able to make that happen. Uh, we appreciate, again, all of you there. Uh, your member of Congress there, you can call that number. That'll just tell them where you live. They'll hook you up with who your congressperson is and make that happen. If you don't know who they are, they need to know. And for that further information, there's the information on the website, the Facebook page, et cetera. So please uh, do that. Investigate. If, you if you're new to it, find out some information. Uh, we are available uh, to be able to do any of these kind of calls with your representative. If you can get the meeting lined up, we can get Alfek on the phone, Chief. She basically, this is her life. She gets on there and she talks about this uh, all the time with people and, and is there to, to be the backup. But there's nothing like your voice talking to your representative at the end of the day. We can be there for backup, but you're the one that has to be able to say, this is what I want. And here's the person I want you to hear from so that you understand why we need this. We can do that for you. But you, you're the one that has to make that happen. So again, thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time and everything that you've done. Have a great evening and a great weekend. And if you're in Ohio or in the northern part and the snow and ice is coming down, please stay safe tonight. So thank you very much. Good Bye. night.